warm greetings for all those who are participating uh, for us uh, with this seminar on Sudan on the reimagining the security sector in Sudan. My name is uh, Dr. Luca Viendi. I am the Dean of Academic Affairs. Uh, at uh, Africa Center for Strategic Studies, and I am professor of practice for security studies. I, uh, I direct the Africa Center's ac academic programs, linking them with centers research, and I am the uh, supervisor of these um, uh, sessions on on the internet on Sudan. So I will be the moderator for this morning's session, ladies and gentlemen. This session, the series of session uh, on Sudan. Uh, on the, uh, the the role of the security sector in this democratic transition will be organized by the ACSS Africa Center for Strategic Studies and USIP United States Institute of Peace. First and foremost, I would like to uh, welcome all those who have uh, participated in the first and a second uh, session on the reimagining the security sector of uh, Sudan. This uh, this uh, session is the third session of the series of the fifth of five sessions on Sudan, and it will focus uh, on the uh, reform of the security uh, sector in in Sudan. It will we will talk about the African experience. Per se. This session, the uh, the the uh, remaining sessions, and uh, the next session will focus uh, on uh, will be held on April twelfth, and will be uh, talking about the national security uh, strategy uh, and uh, the following one will focus on on the development of national security strategy uh, during the uh, democratic transition in Sudan. We would like to uh, present the main objective for this session, ladies and gentlemen, this session, as I said before, uh, will focus on the reform of the security sector and the national security strategy uh, in uh, and and we will talk about the african experience we will be we will have three objectives we will uh, discuss about the uh, logical uh, reasons behind the uh, impl implementing a national security strategy and the reasons why we should uh, implement that national secu security strategy and talk about the reform sector. Second uh, is to, uh, we will talk about the uh, challenges during this transitional uh, period, especially uh, during the years uh, of, uh, of uh, the uh, old authority and the reconstruction of a new uh, security sector and the redesigning of of, uh, security institutions. The third objectives. Uh, the third objective will focus on the, uh, of course, the role of leadership, leadership, and the development of national security strategy, and uh, the, and of course, during this uh, democratic transition. Before, uh, before presenting the moderator of this session, please, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to uh, talk about the main lessons that we drew from the previous session, uh, and of course that we could, we have uh, drawn from uh, other uh, countries uh, concerning the civil-military uh, relations. So we would like about the specific to talk about the specificity of the solution, uh, of course the policy, uh, and this. In, in majority of African countries, and, and not only in Sudan, we have realized the importance of the security uh, sector. And we have also seen that in Asia. We have seen, of course, the civil military relations shape uh, the, the, the country. And it is in Sudan, it is different from, uh, from other countries, the intervention of the, uh, of the military in the politics. And of course, before the independence was very important. We have also, we have talked about the coup d'etats and uh, so on and so forth. Se second, we have also uh, understood that it's very important to focus on uh, the uh, horizontal and uh, transversal relations, especially in the social uh, tissue. And we have also talked about the, uh, the, 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 the society. We have talked about several uh, 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 components lack of trust. We have talked about uh, the lack of trust uh, uh, in in the military institution in order to uh, realize the uh, stability, the political stability. That lack of trust was uh, one of the main points we have discussed uh, this uh, this uh, during the seminar. We have talked about oppression. We have talked about dictatorship, and we have also talked about how military institutions uh, dominate the authority. And despite all of these uh, components components, we have realized that there are uh, elements in the military institutions that still believe in the uh, 
democratic transition and in democracy. And we have seen that, of course, uh, it is very important to focus on these elements for the uh, uh, transition in Sudan democratic the transition in Sudan. The third point that uh, the third point focused on that issue or a, a lack of trust. And we saw that it's very important in order to promote that lack of trust, to have some kind of transparency, to have legislation that is put in practice and, and also to, to of course, uh, 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 deal with uh, some major issues and focus on this uh, transition and this democratic transition, especially through the putting in place legislators. Uh, we also thought that transparency is very important within the military, uh, uh, of course, uh, arena. We have also uh, drawn a very uh, important lesson regarding uh, this uh, uh, transparency during the transitional period to put in place peace, uh, stability, and of course, to ensure that there is a smooth transition towards democracy. We have also uh, learned about procedures that should, of course, focus on political willingness on all the parties. Lastly, we have also uh, learned that it's very important to have a sustainable process in this regard. And this, uh, and this uh, of course, uh, it is, and, and, and of course, we have come to understand that it, there has to be this lack of trust between, between the different institutions, between the citizens, in order to serve the best interests of the country and uh, uh, create some kind of social cohesion. This, uh, of course, is very important, uh, and this uh, demands a lot of effort from citizens and from all the institutions. And it is also very important to supervise the security sector, uh, which means means that the, uh, we need to have effective military inst institutions that promote uh, the participation of gender and other components. And in order, in order to, of course, uh, ensure the smooth transition to a democratic uh, regime. And uh, we thought also that it's very important to have the necessary resources uh, in this regard in order to uh, reach our objective, which means that the civil authority has to be able and has to be capable to have a strong vision and to have a, a, an effective leadership. This is what we learned overall from the previous session uh, in our, for our say during our seminar. Uh, today, we would like uh, to present the moderator of the session. Uh, she is, her name is uh, Susan Steigen. Uh, of course, I, uh, I worked with uh, Susan and uh, of course, when, uh, when uh, 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 a long time ago, and uh, we worked together for designing uh, the in Sudan for designing this uh, some of the programs we have uh, worked uh, in Sudan in uh, for from 2005 to 2011. Uh, she was uh, worked uh, in in this in this regard, and and uh, it was very important contribution. Uh, she is a director of Africa programs uh, at the United States Institute of Peace where she oversees programming in South Sudan, Nigeria, and Sudan. And so now she is, uh, of course, managing constitutional development, citizen engagement, and, and election observation programs that was uh, at the NDI before. Uh, she is the director of Africa program at the US Institute of Peace, where she oversees program in South Sudan, as I said, and she served as a, uh, she was, uh, as I said, managed uh, constitutional development, as I said, citizen engagement and, and election observation programs. And then she served, she became a program director with NDI in South Sudan, uh, where she supported the implementation of the peace agreement. Uh, uh, Professor Susan, welcome to our session. We thank you very much for your presence. Thank you, Dr. Luca. Shukra uh, Dr. Luca. Well, Good peace, afternoon uh, to everybody peace else. be upon you. And uh... it's a pleasure to be uh, joining everybody for for this uh, conversation and uh, to facilitate uh, the conversation amongst our experts today in this third of the series of the the webinars on reimagining the security sector in Sudan. Uh, as Dr. Luca said, we will focus today on the interconnection between security sector reform and national security strategies. And we have three excellent panelists to share their experiences, their expertise, and their insights from across Africa. So allow me first to, to introduce our panelists, and then we will dive directly into, into the conversation. 
Um, so first, I'm very pleased to be joined by Dr. Madani Tedessa. He is an academic specialist on peace and security issues in Africa and is a visiting professor at the African Leadership Center at King's College in London. He has served in various senior roles advising uh, those who are designing uh, security sector reform processes, including the president of Somaliland and the Ethiopian foreign minister in the mid 1990s. He drafted and developed the Horn of Africa strategy for security sector reform, and he provided extensive support to the African Union Commission in conceptualizing, drafting, and finalizing its policy framework on security sector reform. He also facilitated the development of a national security policy for the new Republic of South Sudan. So we're so pleased to have you with us, uh, Dr. Tedessa. Secondly, we're joined by Dr. Emil Wadrago. Dr. Ramil um, has also a wealth of experience on security issues in Africa. He's currently an adjunct professor of practice at the Africa Center with his research paper focused on advancing military professionalism in Africa. He compiled various case studies on national security strategy dialogue in Africa that were the basis of the national security strategy dialogue toolkit. He is a member of, um, he is the president, sorry, of the Foundation for Citizen Security in Burkina Faso. And he served as a member of the scientific committee that guided Burkina Faso's national security strategy dialogue. He's a retired professional military officer and he served as minister of security in Burkina Faso. Thirdly, we're joined by Dr. Tamar Abdul Karim, who, whom you met in the previous seminars. He is the deputy director of the Peace Research Institute at the University of Khartoum, where he's also a lecturer in the Department of Sociology and Social Anthropology. He is the program coordinator for the project of assisting regional universities in Sudan, and he also serves as the academic secretary of the Nubian Study Center. So welcome to all of our plan panelists. We're, we're so pleased to have you with us here today. Dr. Tedessa, I'm going to turn to you first um, and, and ask if you can help us to frame um, this link um, and some of the reasons that drive um, national security strategy in Africa and the link to security sector reform and why it's important that security sector reform, reform is guided by a broader strategic framework. Dr. Tedessa, over to you. Thank you, uh, Suzanne. And obviously, uh, the link between security sector reform and uh, national security policy uh, and strategy, of course, this is much broader than just NSP, is um, very uh, clear in the sense that it's not only the, the linkage between the two that matters most in Africa, but also a national security policy is, you know, a guiding principle and an overarching document for even, you know, broader long-term political processes, not short-term, you know, kind of projects. Uh, so uh, national security policy is not only critical and crucial for security sector reform, but even for broader state building, you know, um, imperatives because of the African situation. So in a sense, one, it can build state institutions and create, you know, uh, the necessary conditions for state building process. The point here is that the profound connectedness to state building process in Africa is very important. And SSR itself is also linked in, in several ways. And the issues that connect us both state building and SSR is national security policy. In broader terms, it can positively influence the behavior of the African state. And obviously, there is a lot of unpredictability of the state because of lack of this institutional, political, and process-oriented outcomes. So an NSP process can obviously help, you know, ensure the predictability of the African state, which is also very, very critical. Then 
And national security policy can help also, you know, foster conversation, you know, around several issues in, in terms of both political, social, you know, you know, and other developments. It can help through conversation, wider conversation to ensure political processes become more representative and inclusive. So conversations are varied in several ways. Sometimes even silence, silence can be a form of conversation. Even violence can be a form of conversation, but we prefer dialogue to be a form of conversation in state building process. And the main entry point for national conversation would, would be the national security uh, policy. So the link with state building process is very important because of the discrepancy in the African you know, security universe, you know, the discrepancy between statehood and nationhood, between state formation and you know, the state building. And because of the alienation of the security forces, mainly the military historically in Africa. So in order to resolve these issues, you need to have a national security uh, policy, very much so in Africa because of the, the, the tensions that I have mentioned. So whether it is about building security institutions from the ground up as in Liberia, for instance, or reforming existing institutions like in Ghana, it is always an enterprise linked to the development of a viable state, one that is able to offer security and safety to its people. So in a way, what I'm trying to say is that in broader terms, it can help to build the social contract in Africa by bringing different actors, by bringing you know, citizens and different stakeholders into national dialogue in framing a common vision. So the, the value chain of national security policy and strategy is much broader than what we think. And it can also you know, build you know, the, a kind of regional integration and peaceful you know, coexistence because national security policy, as I have said, leads to some form of predictability. As a result of that, you know, it can regionalize SSR as well. And uh, th that's why it's were also very important. Now, apart from that, in any process that leads to NSP, there is clear issue that comes out, which is national ownership. You cannot ensure ownership unless you have an overarching framework, which is owned, conceptualized, and led by a national process or national actors. In a way, countries with a national security policy can have more ownership on their own political processes, very much so also on security sector reform processes. Beyond that, you know, it's obviously clear that NSP in a very truncated form also gives, you know, the roadmap. It helps to frame and, and the roadmap and compass for SSR. So in a way, you can guide reform processes by having an overarching national security policy. So because the problem is that unless you have such a long-term inclusive, consultative, participatory process, then most of the reform processes become either fragmented, short-term, or maybe limited in silos. So in the absence of such a framework, in the absence of such a long-term and comprehensive framework, there is a risk that reform process or policies are debated, designed, or implemented simply based on norms and assumptions than on empirical findings or in a, on a basic understanding of the political economy cultural context and local circumstances of the society is concerned. That's why leadership becomes very important here. So I think in terms of the value of NSP, particularly in Africa, particularly due to the historicity of the state, it's very crucial that we need to have such a, an overarching, long-term looking, 
compass before we go to secret sector reform processes. Sometimes it doesn't work because it's time consuming, but at least there must be some kind of, you know, a preliminary kind of national vision that could really, you know, incrementally develop into an NSP, at least until, you know, you develop a full-fledged and consultative national security policy. So there must be at least a vision that could serve as a basis for NSP that also helps to guide, you know, secret sector reform process in Africa. Thanks, Dr. Tedessa. I think you've you've made a very compelling case about why this matters. Um, and um, I particularly appreciate the points about predictability in an unpredictable time. I, I'd like to hear a little bit more about the challenges. Um, you've, you've supported various processes related to security sector reform, national security strategy dialogue. And what, what do you think are some of the most important challenges and particularly in a context where a country is undertaking a transition from um, security institutions that were focused previously on a regime to security institutions that are focused on people, that are people-centered. Well, um, there are several challenges, but the most important ones I think are, one is political in terms of, you know, the transition itself. For instance, you know, people might think like, if let's take for instance, the whole issue of demilitarization or demobilization. Political leaders or leaders of armed groups or the military might want to demobilize their army because of the imper imperatives of the transition, but they might not be ready to demobilize their mind. I mean, so demobilizing the mind and framing it in a different way uh, will take uh, much more time. And in, in different contexts in several African countries, on the one hand, you have uh, a national security service, which is confused with even national security policy in, in several uh, countries. Then you have uh, the whole issue of governance and, and, and operational effectiveness, which has been really a tension. Many African countries, mainly those emerging from conflict, some of them in a transition, you know, the, themselves, they cannot really have the institutions in place to reform uh, the institutions themselves. Because in most of the post-conflict situations, what we have generally is that either weak or, you know, unprofessional security institutions. So in such a situation, what we find is that most of the security institutions in, in those countries, mainly in transition contexts, they might require more of training and more of you know, security sector development than professionalization and security sector reform. So there is that tension in many African countries, mainly in fragile you know, post-conflict contexts, the balance between governance and professionalization, the, the, the balance between uh, you know, good governance, civilian control, democratic control, and, and uh, you know, operational effectiveness of those institutions. Because those armies, either they have to be amalgamated to, to create uh, a lot of, like for instance, a national army in South Sudan, that was the case. Even now in Sudan, that could be the case. So I think one is about capacity, political will, but also about knowledge on how to navigate such a terrain. And unless, and in, in many cases, like for instance, in a post-conflict environment, most of the political elite might not have reached a consensus. So elite bargain might, might take a lot of time while security institutions are rushed to demilitarization and also you know, um, creating a national army like in South Sudan or now uh, the case of uh, Sudan. And also the tendency to conceive SSR as an essentially technical, technocratic process than a political process. Uh, you know, as I have mentioned, abandoning its profound connectedness to state building process. There is a tendency to view transitions as you know, starting from a ceasefire or peace agreement up to elections, while 
you know, these processes are part of the broader state building process and they have to be long term. So that is one of the challenges. The other challenge is looking at these sectors, mainly the secret sectors, mainly in silos in a fragmented man manner, rather than, you know, having an, a whole government approach, you know, looking at, you know, all the, and in, in many transitions, the focus is mainly on the military or the national intelligence. And most of the rule of law institutions are forgotten practically. And without the rule of law, then the sustainability of any reform process, mainly the judiciary is forgotten, mainly prisons are forgotten, the courts. I think there are several, several cases that could really be pinpointed as challenges, but I think I have to stop it there, yeah. Thank you. I also want to pick up on something you mentioned in your initial remarks related to leadership. Um, and I think this ties to your, your, your other points about reaching a, an elite agreement um, and also the political nature of this process. So um, could you talk a little bit more about why, why leadership matters um, in a national security strategy and security sector reform process um, and, and your experience in um, what are, what are some indicators of strong leadership um, in, in these processes where you've been engaged to date? Well, uh, obviously, one, leadership is situational. Uh, situations create leaders, and uh, it very much depends on the nature of uh, the political process. If you have very inclusive and consultative and representative representative political processes, then the process becomes legitimate. So whatever um, policy imperatives, including national security policy or SSR, will not be a very contested one. So th the process matters in a way. If you have, for instance, visionary leaders or rational actors, or if you are lucky, transformative leaders who really preside over you know, inclusive and representative political process on a long-term basis in terms of institutional building and everything, then uh, that, that, that creates, you know, a conducive environment for such this kind of, uh, you know, um, endeavor. So legitimacy is also important. And legitimacy is not simply about elections. Sometimes you, you can vote somebody and they can lead you to, to hell, you know, but, it's about, it's about the process. So either through elections or peace agreement or a national uh, unity government, there should be a legitimate you know, uh, political process that leads to a legitimate leadership. And the whole issue of fellowship, the fellowship of the leader, for instance. Fellow, fellowship alone might not save you, but fellowship probably coupled with expertise, you know, power, and some a little bit of coercive power, I mean, in terms of control of, you know, the security situation, then in such a situation, you know, uh, leadership matters. Uh, the whole issue of mutuality, you know, in terms of leadership, is the leader simply, you know, picked and, you know, representing some partisan agendas, but, you know, does the political elite work in the form of mutuality? Is the leader more uh, transactional or transformational? I think these are very important issues in, in, in different, uh, for instance, I can give you one example, like in Ethiopia, there was a national security policy development process. Well, it was highly dominated by the expertise power of the then prime minister, you know, Mel Zenau. So somehow it was consultative, but independent actors were not involved. It was a kind of top down process. In South Sudan, there was no united leadership. There was no legitimate leadership during the process of the national security policy uh, development. Why? While the national security policy development process was going on and reaching its final stage, there was a fracture within the SPLM. So, you know, it has become the victim of, you know, the, the division within the SPLM. This was in 2013. So, the point here is that if you have a very united leadership, you know, uh, working in mutuality through a representative and, and inclusive political process, having more rational actors and legitimate players, then that helps, you know, to foster dialogue and, 
you know, increase, you know, then the, the probability of having, you know, a process that could really um, help uh, transform the country in several ways. So I think leadership is very important in, in, this, in this aspect as, as in other, you know, transitional processes. Thank you, Dr. Teresa. I, I, I appreciate especially how you've talked about the need to balance these many different considerations. And sometimes we, we spend a lot of time talking about how <clears throat> SSR and national security are not, are not just technical, they're very political. Um, but I think you make the point that it is the, the integration and balancing of, of all of those aspects together. Um, I'm sure our colleagues um, will have a number of questions for you and want to come back and hear more about your, your insights and your experience. I'd like to now turn to Dr. Emil and bring him into the conversation. And, and Dr. Emil, I'd, uh, I'd like to bring you in and um, get some of your reflections um, about what you've seen as the main challenges facing um, such reform processes, especially in contexts where, where there may be security sector reform absent a broader national security strategy. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Susan. Thank you for the, the kind introduction. And also thank, uh, thank you, Tadasi, for, uh, for the theoretical framework and also paving the way for, the, for my contribution. Uh, before I start, I will, uh, I will start by saying that uh, uh, each country has its own uh, specificities uh, regarding security sector reform. In Africa, we, it, it could vary from uh, uh, context, uh, three contexts, namely the conflict uh, context, uh, the post-conflict uh, context, like the case in Cote d'Ivoire, Liberia, Sierra Leone, Burundi, and DRC, and the democratic transition settings. This is the new uh, context, uh, like in Madagascar, Burkina Faso, Tunisia, the Gambia, and uh, uh, today in uh, Sudan. So uh, what I want to, to highlight here is that in, uh, in the conflict uh, settings, peace agreements followed by a good uh, GDR process are uh, really the prerequisites very important, very vital for a longer term security sector reform and a national security strategy development. Uh, in post-conflict context, as we all know, the United Nations and the African Union approaches to security sector reform was developed predominantly in post-conflict settings. And therefore, uh, security sector reform is heavily tired to peace building. So I will try to, uh, these, these approaches are highlighted in the three main documents. I will talk of, uh, about the United Nations Security Council resolution of 2151, the post-conflict reform, post-conflict reconstruction and development policy of the African Union, and the last one, the African Union policy framework on security sector reform. But in conflict setting uh, settings, NSSD is part of the security sector reform programming. These tools today and these legal frameworks, uh, as I said, uh, developed for post conflict settings, uh, are no more, uh, some are. Uh, need to be adapted, we need to be adapted to new context. Uh, this new context is a transitioning democracies like the case of Sudan, like the case of Burkina Faso, the case of Tunisia. Uh, if not, uh, this, these are legal frameworks and these are, uh, the tools are not really adapted. So in, demo, in the transitioning democracy, uh, democracies context, uh, the main objective is sustaining the peace agenda. And, cons and consolidating the nascent uh, democracy. Uh, in this context, security sector reform and national security strategy go hand in hand. Like uh, was saying my, my the previous speaker, that's it. The security sector, as far as I'm concerned, seems to be the, the main challenge in the context of democratic transition, especially 
when the, 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 some of the countries went through a long authoritarian rule or military rule, like the case of Sudan or Burkina Faso again. So implementing security sector reform in this particular context uh, aims, aims mainly to prevent the disruption of the democratic uh, process in degenerating into violence or reverting back to, uh, to non-democratic uh, regimes. But we still have a uh, fresh in mind what's happened in Mali. Uh, they were possible going through the security sector reform and we had a military, a military coup who was staged. Uh, also in Burkina Faso, we had a, a, a failed coup uh, and we have a lot of betweenies also uh, as, uh, in Burkina as well as uh, uh, in Sudan. So uh, the challenges remain almost uh, the same, regardless of the context. Uh, what uh, from my own experience, uh, I think uh, I can briefly try to highlight uh, some of the, the major and the main ones. Uh, Professor Tadese has already mentioned the, 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 the political will. I think the main challenge of security sector reform is the political will. I will always say I was in Madagascar uh, for a AU mission to implement the security sector reform. And at the beginning, the leaders were, were very eager to, to reform, the, 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 to reform the, the security sector because they were, uh, they were looking for legitimacy and recognition of the international community because they were banned. After the smooth and fast planification phase, the implementation uh, phase remained stagnant since 2017 because, uh, the lack of, because of the lack of the political will and also uh, because the uh, the international community have lifted, uh, I mean, the ban on the political authorities. So it's very, very important. Uh, you mentioned also the lack of uh, sustainable resources. And I would also add the, hev the heavy reliance on external partnership, uh, external partners. We have also the strong resistance to reforms and change. And this is person, uh, particularly uh, uh, observed in the security sector uh, personnel, maybe because of our service interest, maybe because of uh, personal interest, uh, maybe uh, they are looking to maintain a, a position of, of influence or position of power and, and patronage. And it's very important. It's a serious challenge because Guinea-Bissau, a small country in West Africa, is a, is a, is very, it's a, it's a very uh, instructive uh, uh, example. In 2012, a coup d'etat was staged by military officials, of talking of generals, because they were not happy, they were not happy uh, with the reform, because they were provisioning the reform uh, relating to their compulsory retirement and a reduction of their privileges. In Guinea-Bissau, uh, even generals could, re they don't go on retirement. And uh, the security se sector reform uh, made a provision to, 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 to let them uh, uh, go on retirement. And it was a reason to, to, to make, to stage a coup. There's also one challenge, very important, the reluctance of, to, to the use of term security sector reform. Uh, I've, I've observed that military and security institutions, they don't like the term security sector reform. They prefer the term governance, restructuration, professionalization. And during the, the, the transition period in Burkina Faso, the president, the, the, transition, the transition president requested a security sector reform assistance from the UN in order to consolidate, consolidate uh, the democratic uh, transition. But the military uh, completely refused. They refused on the pretext that the Burkina Faso did not wage war, there were no war. The Burkina Faso was not a, a, a failed state. There were no conflict. So there's no reason for, for them to go for security sector reform. So the mindset is that security sector reform is only for, for a, a conflict affected countries, this, which is not uh, true. Matadese mentioned also the weak institution and governance and inherited from the crisis and the, and the conflict in the past regime. And the absence of a democratic culture also is due to the long rule 
or either military or author authoritarian. In addition uh, to the challenges, uh, most countries going through XSS are facing internal security uh, threats. Like the case of Burkina, we have terrorism, we have uh, some insurgencies combined with terrorism, we have some militia forces, uh, and still violent crimes constitute really a serious uh, challenge poses a, a serious uh, challenges to the you know, security sector uh, reform process. And you mentioned also the, the vision. I think the lack of uh, long-term vision is uh, also impacting on the security sector reform in Africa because they, they are not able to find the right balance between uh, the train and equip strategy because they are ready to get the, the assistance, but only train and equip strategy. With the longer term, aiming at uh, improving the good governance, uh, the civilian oversight, the rule of law, the respect of human rights and gender mainstreaming, which could really uh, help in, uh, in sustaining the, the, the process once it's, 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 uh, it starts. And the last challenge, uh, which is very important as far as I'm concerned, and from experience, is the external partners. Coordinating donor aids in terms of conflicting donor policies, multiplicity, redundancy, the focus on some donors on traditional military agencies, like uh, mainly the, the, the military and, uh, and the, the police, uh, leaving behind the, 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 the justice and, and other uh, key, uh, key elements. Those are things undermining the local ownership. So these are all, the, 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 I mean, the majority of challenges uh, facing African countries when it's, 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 it comes to implement uh, security sector uh, reform. So back to you, uh, Susan. I hope I have responded to your question. Absolutely. Thanks, Dr. Emil. And, and you, you left off on the question of national ownership. Um, mm -hmm. and the importance um, of being able to manage um, external assistance um, and also the, the inherent value and importance of national ownership. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about how um, these types of reforms have been funded and how that impacts on national ownership and the link to the sustainability of the reform process. Mm. Okay, uh, thank you, Susan. Uh, uh, Tadisi mentioned it, uh, national ownership is it's all about conceiving, designing, leading, managing, coordinating, and implementing, and monitoring, and finally evaluating the, the, I mean the, 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 the entire process. But as you all know, uh, the deleterious uh, security environment in Africa uh, make them to, to go. I mean, it is external factors uh, could come in because uh, definitely it's very important. And they should, if you want to talk about uh, national uh, ownership, they should be able to align their support with the agenda of the recipient uh, country they intend to support. But that is not almost the, the, the case. I will come back uh, to it. But who funding security reforms in Africa? Uh, I was in, in Dakar in 2018, I think, uh, for the, I was attending the, the recent, the, the, the Dakar International Forum on Peace and Security. When I look ahead, uh, the Minister of Defense of uh, Niger and Mali saying that the security, uh, the defense and the security of Mali and Niger is almost one third of the national budget of the country. This is very, very, very uh, important. Uh, so uh, uh, this, the, the, the great paradox lies that despite uh, these important budgetary allocations, the security sector remains uh, the least subjected to scrutiny and good management rules. And we must bear in mind that like, uh, we all know that uh, security sector reform is a uh, technically a financially challenging endeavor. It's very important to therefore to tap on the, the national budget 
and also uh, the ex external uh, partners uh, uh, at the same time making sure we don't lose the ownership of the of the, 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 the process however the external funding is never guaranteed because we had uh, some examples from some countries like Guinea Bissau even Sierra Leone or Ghana where the the external partners uh, suddenly withdrew their, their commitments at the time it was uh, most needed. So uh, this is uh, things impacting seriously in the, on the national ownership and also the sustainability of the reforms. And also the national ownerships is impacted when it's only a, a, a external partners driven uh, support of the, of the process. It can impact on the, 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 the national sovereignty. You can uh, agree with me that a sovereign state should not depend entirely on the foreign support uh, for a sector that is central to, uh, to, to key elements. I mean, we need all support, but the main, 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 main uh, support should come from the states. Uh, we should keep in mind that uh, the external, uh, ex the external uh, uh, actors also uh, impact their, their, their ads, impact also in, in the financial autonomy and the sustain, sustainability of the country. It also brings challenges in institutional capacity. And finally, it uh, also brings a coordination issues of, uh, of their activities. The lack of coordination between recipient countries and the external partners results sometimes in duplications and redundancy in some activities. And it finally ends up being very counterproductive in terms of national ownership and sustainability of the reforms. I used to say that in Mali, we have more than 12 partners, partners acting in the country. Uh, up to now, I think uh, the lack of coordination uh, we are not making a efficient and uh, such uh, aids. So uh, these challenges list are uh, just listed. Uh, the most important is the, the national core funding, which is not uh, obviously what is uh, uh, done in Africa. We should we need to have a clear partnership framework and contingency plans to cope with this uh, dilemma of having a, a very erratic uh, founding of the national budget. And also the, the issues I just raised for the ex external uh, support. I hope I have answered your question. Thank you, Dr. Emil. I think um, that our, our colleagues in Sudan are probably um, hearing what you're saying and seeing many, many points that may relate to, to their own experience and their, their own aspirations. So I'd like to turn um, now to Dr. Hatamer and to bring him into the conversation and, and, and ask him a little bit as you, as you listen um, to, to your colleagues um, talk about some of these lessons learned and experiences across Africa, what, what stands out to you and what, what do you think that Sudan could do differently and learn um, from these experiences? especially in, in the context of the security arrangements that are provided in the Juba Peace Agreement. And I'm sure as everybody saw over the weekend, the, the signing of the Declaration of Principles between, between the government and, and um, uh, Abdelaziz El Hilu. Um, so Dr. Tamar, over, over to you to help us to anchor this into, into Sudan's experience. Uh, thanks again uh, for, for inviting me for such a very interesting and timely, very important for us to, to have such a discussion about the importance of having a national strategy for security sector and, and how to broaden the notion of the security. And, and I, most of the points raised by, by previous speakers, I really found it very relevant and very much like, uh, it's, it speaks to our experience and the need to to, to reform our security sector and within a broader vision of transitional and, 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 and building nation building processes we are going through and also connecting that to the 
uh, peace building processes. So it is much, very much needed kind of discussion because that, that kind of discussion will really help into the main issue which we have been highlighted, the issue of ownership. And, and uh, so I, I would go through, through some points highlighted and try to reflect how, how that is connected to our experience. One of the main idea started by uh, Dr. Metani uh, is like, of course, I, I can't say there is an absent of, uh, like saying there is an absent is, is somehow a big word. Of course, there must be some kind of uh, uh, security strategy, but the fact that I don't know is for me, it's almost like, so it is not a, hello? Yeah, Dr. Samuel, can you talk in Arabic? Okay, good, good. One of the, uh, the things that were uh, brought up, which is very important, and it, it, it really actually addresses to the need for to reform the security sector in within a larger plan that has to do with the nation building process. I mean, one of the basic things that we have and that we need in this transitional period is to, is to rebuild the Sudanese nation in a different way than it has been for many years. Because as you know, we went through revolution. I mean, it was uh, a very uh, marginalized to only a very small sector, the people that really benefited from the rule. Not everyone was included. That's why we have to go back to the nitty gritty, to the very basics of things. If we, we, if we were to transition to a democratic nation, a nation that has uh, multi-represent, I mean, um, I mean if, through this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention some of the points that were said by the speakers before me. So one of the things is that, yes, for sure, um, when we say that there is no security plan, it is a hard thing. It's a difficult thing, of course. But when we may say, we can say with all confidence that there is no, there's no way we can say that there is a plan for security that we produce that every Sudanese had a voice in. No. But the thing is, I mean, it's in the past, it always used to be the security sectors, the military, that they were the ones who were uh, molding everything. Uh, and that is why we're saying that we're going to, from the, went to the regime center security to a people center security. And not to be serving the government, the people in, who are governing, but a, a regime that is providing security for all. So this is gonna be the first leaps and uh, the points and something that Dr. Hani said, that the unpredictability, so, uh, for, so if a security system and military that is not working under the law or the constitution, I th and if all Sudanese are not, do not have a voice in molding this new system, I don't think they will have, it will have any predictability because it doesn't re not represent. So, I mean, um, one of the simple examples that we, I can give after the peace uh, uh, treaty in Duba, one of the points is that uh, there was forces around the Khartoum and people said, why are these forces here? People got terrified. Uh, and because they were not notified that there's going to be steps and stages and transitions that were going to happen. And uh, there was going to be forces to come. But the, but the people were not aware of this coup. So there was this uh, surprise. There is this feeling of insecurity. And uh, they asked the, the following question. Why are these forces intervening? Why are we not included? And one of the main important points that we have to focus is to broaden the uh, the concept of security. We should look at security from a broader perspective. Pers perspective. And uh, we, uh, so the Juba agreement uh, aimed, aimed at uh, 
uh, did not was not in its nature inclusive because the representatives of uh, of the of the military forces uh, the, and and of course uh, the defense security were not uh, were not included so they they talked about the political arrangements so this is not uh, applicable to uh, the concept that was uh, uh, you know talked about by our colleagues it uh, it was so we had academic academics and we had and we had the, the, the youth generation and we had the people and, and the professionals and uh, had to discuss the the strategic security plan and had to look at the content of it and had to see that it's moving from uh, from leader centered regime to uh, a people centered uh, regime in all its 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 categories so here i would like to say yes um Yes, uh, in order to take into consideration the Juba agreement, we have to look at several details within this agreement and we need to see all of these aspects discussed at, at, uh, at a societal level. And one of the things that I that, that I discussed in the previous se seminar, there was a uh, there was a dilemma, a dilemma uh, that uh, uh, the, the dilemma, and I expressed the view that the, the, that we do not have a unified uh, uh, force. Uh, and, and yesterday, uh, the principle of decoration that was uh, signed by uh, Al Halil and, uh, and of course uh, Al Burhan uh, p p uh, was per discussed or focused on the necessity of single army, which means that we have to have a unified, uh, you know, military with probably unified, but with different creeds, but with a unified military vision. But the details um, uh, regarding. Uh, the uh, putting in place the strategy uh, is still pending. We have to have broad discussions in this regard and the perspective has to be very, uh, very broad and clear. So this is one of the main points that I wanted to discuss with you, ladies and gentlemen, they do. Uh, so we, we have, uh, we focus on the nationwide uh, conversation. We should not have a selection in the process. We should, uh, the process should not be selective and we have to have uh, not a discussion within certain categories. We have to have a unified discussion, broad discussion, because the security sector uh, will be produced through this broad perspective. And if there is no broad participation uh, regarding the objectives uh, of the reform of the of the of the future phase, then we will always uh, remain within this dilemma, and we will have we will find ourselves uh, before a situation deprived of leg legitimacy. Uh, uh, so uh, so. Um, myself as a citizen, uh, regardless of, uh, for example, my belonging to uh, the, the, uh, one uh, regime or not, is is the security sector uh, provides me with the necessary answers. Uh, myself as a citizen, as a citizen in Sudan. So uh, all the security sectors were similar to like terrorist uh, regimes. And so we have to have this unified vision and the perspective has to be broader. So I will, I will go um, uh, forward and uh, uh, I will uh, talk about this idea of uh, uh, social uh, cohesion, because this is the purpose, because when we discuss the security sector and, uh, and, and what it can bring to us, uh, uh, we have to have like a broad understanding. It, it, we're not talking here only about uh, militarization. We are talking about human security. We're talking about peace building and we're talking about development. And so there are so many points that are inextricably linked to this broad description of security. And that leads us to understand uh, and, and, and talk about the, 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 the security strategy in large. Uh, this uh, creates, of course, this uh, provides the uh, common ground for contract, which uh, which uh, which clarifies uh, the fact that the security has a certain legitimacy, has its laws, has its, uh, and this provides us with opportunities to 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 bring Sudan and to rebuild uh, uh, Sudan. Uh, uh, of course, uh, we we have also. Um, 
we have also talked about prevailing issues. We have, we, it's necessary to talk about these issues uh, that are, in, for example, pertaining to a lack of trust. I'm not talking about uh, the lack of trust of citizens towards vis-a-vis uh, -vis the security sector. No, uh, we are talking here about other military institutions. We're talking here about integration. So when we uh, talk about unification of these forces, uh, we see that there is a kind of resilience, resistance, and we we have to see this issue of inclusiveness and inclusion. And I have to be in a position where I can see this unification. And I think that the reform, the change of reform has to be within an agreed uh, strategic uh, participative approach, because then we can have the, the, the trust, the level of trust that's that's increased. And I see that the, the lack of trust is not only vis-a-vis -vis the uh, citizens and the, and the security uh, forces. I'm talking about the trust between the security forces themselves and militia as military uh, and, and all of these forces need to build this, this trust uh, within their own institutions in order not to face the future, uh, future dilemmas. So I think it is only when we have realized that that we can talk about, uh, about a unified uh, Sudan and, and we can also face other uh, issues. I think this structure will help us, uh, of course, uh, handle this lack of trust between the between the security forces. And this uh, has uh, ha this is, this has an inextricable link with the social ownership, so to say. Um, in addition to that, I wanted to talk about um, there is a progress uh, regarding the the agreements uh, in the, the principle of decorations. There is a progress, but the main of the, the the most important thing is that we we still do not have the details regarding the mechanisms that will be handled regarding the formation of a unified military institution. Uh, so when we talk about the security sector, we have to broaden our understanding, our pers perspective vis-a-vis -vis other uh, sec sectors, uh, security intelligence, and see how we can uh, transform the regime towards an oppressive regime to, to a leadership or a, a regime so that we can talk uh, about unification. So. This is very important. We have to have an apparatus that is that is not only able to detect the political opposition, but that is capable of uh, of, of looking at at the, at the broader perspective. So when we talk about corruption, when we talk about smuggling, when we talk about uh, that require the state leadership, and this is very important. It has to be towards uh, the the uh, uh, the best interest of the people, and uh, I think it's very important uh, to say that we see some resistance happening and we uh, we we need to see that political willingness which is very important especially within uh, the forces themselves sometimes we find ourselves that that there is uh, uh, the the of course the the, that we are inheriting, we see ourselves sometimes inheriting the old regime, and uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, so we have uh, we. Th there were people who benefited from that regime, and there were, of course, people who were resisting uh, the, the the reforms. So we have to uh, be able to secure and to uh, and to console people, to reassure them uh, in a, in a positive way, and this is very important for for in order to move things forward. Uh, of course, the the transitional justice has to play in its role, and uh, because uh, there 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 are so many things to be taken in, into account, and we have uh, to work towards a security uh, sector that it's not uh, for, but propelling the same old practices, but that's moving towards a transformative uh, process. We have uh, to uh, to talk about future mechanisms and be able to uh, move uh, forward. Uh, uh, th th there were people whose uh, rights were violated, and we need to take that into account, and we uh, have to uh, be able to, uh, of course, uh, deal with the atrocities and make sure that they're not going to happen again, and 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 move forward uh, uh, in the spirit of connectedness and cohesion, which is uh, which is going to propel the the of course uh, justice and 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 this propel uh, 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 an effective security structure. 
Of course, we have talked about uh, the role of external actors. That is very important. Uh, we need uh, to, sometimes they can be destructive and, uh, and they can be con con constructive. We have sometimes external actors that create a security uh, ag ag agendas that, that uh, and, 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 and I'm talking here about the participation of Sudan and Yemen and, 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 and the Gulf and et cetera. And so the role of external actors is very important. Sometimes they do perpetuate weight, uh, the security structures that we inherited uh, by the regime. So they, they rather, uh, they rather focus uh, on, 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 on the, on the previous regime, because they were kind of, of importing the same principle. So they, they do have an interest in inheriting this, uh, this old regime. So we, in order to, uh, we have to restructure the regime in a constructive way. So we need to pay attention to this, uh, to these external actors. So it can be a hindrance and it can be a, uh, we have to take that into account and we need to focus on the role of external actors and we need need to see how uh, we uh, we can we can we can move forward positively so uh, the external actors of course uh, external factor uh, or actors can can be can be beneficial like we're talking here about uh, african union and so the african reunion uh, role for example can come with uh, with laws that are benefiting us the sudanese people in the security sector uh, so i think i will stop here ladies and gentlemen i hope uh, i hope i have uh, uh, I have reflected somehow on the Sudanese the points they have raised. Thank you, Dr. Tamer. Um, and thank you for really tying together uh, the context in Sudan and how we can draw from the, from the, the wisdom and experience of our, our panelists and also making sure that we're not thinking completely siloed from other transitional processes.